talk about? Oh, we don't want. Um, you don't, you don't, you don't want to tip uh, tip your hand. Uh, <laughs> you don't necessarily have to t- talk about anything. Okay. But uh, you know, when um, when I first contacted you and we had set up that time to meet last right. week, the uh, I'm, I'm actually kind of glad that we postponed because in the time between us having emailed each other and then leading up to our first confirmed date right i had caught a nasty cold okay um on one hand i'm like uh i I just i want to be able to not have to postpone doing these yeah you like to uh, knock them off but then on the next on on the other hand it's like well there was a good chance i wouldn't have been like a hundred percent if i had shown right shown up that day yeah so how you feel now um i think i'm i'm doing i'm doing okay yeah. Uh, I just I'm, I feel like I'm right on like at least like just a, a, one more day or mm-hmm. a couple of days and then I'm like I think I'm gonna be completely fine. Good. But it's like there was just lots of fluids coming out of my head <laughs> and yeah. like it was just spilling out of my out of my uh, orifices and <clears throat> but my like I still got a bit of a cough and my throat's a bit scratchy and dry mm. and all that. But I think it's it's uh, it's getting there. Okay. So how, how's Carol been doing? She's great. She's working hard. She's got a little bit of a break over the the uh, holidays, but uh, you know she spends a lot of time here. Now I don't know if um had did, were you aware of when she was on my podcast um like a few months ago? She told me she did it, but that was about it. Okay. You know I I have I should I should uh, check it out and see what she said. You know I, I haven't heard it. Yeah, okay. Because uh, I'm always curious about how, like, how much people know about the show before they come on. I'm a dunce. Yeah, I think <laughs> <laughs> so just consider it that way. Okay. Because uh, there are some people who, like, um, they, they may listen to a few episodes and like, try to get the vibe of what's going on. Right. Here, or try to figure out how they should, they, they, they should be um, performing, you yeah. could say. Well, I guess it's good and bad. I mean, it's it's good in the sense of I have a clean slate, so I don't have any preconceived notions. But it's bad in the sense of I have no idea what kind of uh, conversations you've had with people and who you've spoken to and what your topics have been. So, Well, the way I try to explain to people, it's, uh, well, if you were to look at, like, the show page. Right. The, well, the title is The Podcast uh-huh. with Benson Ty. Okay. And I don't have a very set format. It's not very it's very indefinite amorphous. Okay. I just first I just um I talk to people for an hour at a time. Okay. Uh so it's uh we it doesn't have to be about anything in particular. Um like some of my favorites that I've done are just like me and a friend like trying to make each other laugh for, for a whole hour or something like that. All right. So Throw something out there. We'll start talking. <laughs> You're the MC. <laughs> uh, this this is correct. Um, well, uh, so, well, first of all, I would like to congratulate you on being. You're the first guest I've had on who have I've literally never met before. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Well, how do you do? <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you, Benson. Nice to meet you, Steve. Because. <laughs> um, well, I started doing this because, like, as if you were to read the show description, it's just um, for me to have conversations with people, connect with them, and and sometimes get out of the house. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, you're out of the house. You're in yeah, our studio. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. And, um, you know, it's it could it could go anywhere. It's like, I mean, perhaps because I've never met you before, it'll be more me kind of asking you questions because sure. it's like a professional curiosity on my behalf, to perhaps find out more about you mm-hmm. uh, outside of what I, I've heard about you from Carol. Okay. You know. Well, I'll give you markers. I, I give you uh, uh, roads to go down, or you can figure it out for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> but also, I think this is like me trying to push my the way I operate, if you, if you know what I mean. Because you know, ev- literally everyone else I've had on a show before is I've met I, like they're friends of mine or like professors. I've right. met them at least in some way before. And so and, you have you have at least some topics you, you, you like, might want to pursue. Or at least have like some kind of rapport with them. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And now it's me. This is me trying to find out how I 
how I behave, how I would it would go if I'm, I'm literally just meeting someone for the first time. Right. Even though I do per- peripherally, like, am aware of you because uh-huh. uh, through Carol. Well, what do you tell me? What you know about me first? Um, I think you're a lawyer. Yes, that's yep. true. <laughs> I'm a, I practice construction law, construction litigation. Uh, I know that you're an artist. You construct uh, various things in this studio here. I do woodworking with furniture, primarily furniture, yeah. uh, mostly um, originally uh, designed somewhat uh, a little bit rough around the edges, not quite Adirondack. That's a school of furniture making. Uh, a lot of um, live edge stuff, a lot of unconventional stuff. I rework things, transform things. Yeah, and I know you're married to Carol. That's true. We've been married since 1974. That's 45 years now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so a long time. She's a much better artist than I am. Yeah, I'm not really <laughs> an artist. She's an artist. She's a very good artist. Are um, you? Are you saying like you don't? Um, like, have you never painted or something like not that? Not really, no. Because no. from what I can tell, it is like woodworking. You're constructing. Exactly. Um, just like, say, t- this table here. Right. I'll make a table. I'll transform a chair. I'll but you're not something. gonna. you're not going to be, like, putting some kind of Steve Kaplan signature through, like, painting a, a particular thing on the table? No. No, that I don't do. Though I try and do uh, unique things with the design of things I do. I mean, if you look around here... Um, any of the tables, I got a lot of tables in here, um, or uh, the um, uh, secretary that's behind you. All none of these are conventional conventional forms. You know, I mean, I'll take a conventional form and work off of it. Uh, so there's a artistic design element to it for sure, no question about that. And that's what I uh, that's what keeps me doing it. Yeah. You know, and that's the interest level for me. I say, okay, uh, if I'm working on something new, what's going to be new about it and different? I'll never make the same thing twice. Um, everything is uh, is done by hand, you know, to the extent of I use power tools. But I'm not using uh, jigs and repetitive uh, uh, machinery that's going to make exactly the same thing every time. Right, okay. So it's um, it's kind of semi-handmade? Oh, it's but definitely not. handmade. I mean, the, I mean the, the the most mechanized stuff I do is I'll I'll use a planer to okay. plane down boards. But I'm joining stuff by hand. I'm you know cutting stuff. I mean, you look around the the, the stuff I've got. Like if you look at the, that that table, that table, that secretary, that table, these tables, you see a lot of services that are irregularly shaped. Yeah, almost nothing I do is uh four by four you know or okay. is, is, is in is in right angles that table there is probably the closest one i have to conventionally shaped and that's that's not exactly and that's an original design anyway so that means that it's got to be handmade because every every piece i put together has to be uh, custom fitted for that shape or that contour right. that's the fun part of it it's also the annoying part of it yeah you know oh, there's some people who would say you say you do, like, at the minimum, use some power tools. Sure. But there are some people who would say, like, real woodworking peers, like, by hand, that means you don't use, like, any kind of mechanized electric, electronic. I guess there, I don't know if there's people using hand saws, uh, uh, hand planers. Uh, I don't know how you're going to, I guess you could drill a hole with with a old-fashioned kind of drill bits that you crank like an old egg beater. I've yeah. seen those. But, uh you can. I think the way I do things is probably about as uh, handmade and uh, as anybody I know. Really, it's not the totally extreme. I don't use any metal, for example, oh, okay. so I won't join anything with screws oh, okay. or bolts or braces. Everything I'm joining is is with uh, glue and dowels, okay. and that's pretty old school. I mean, you know, a lot of stuff is not done that way. Yeah, it does seem like you are. It is furniture. The main thing is furniture. It is furniture. It's got to be functional. Have you, thought, have you thought about other things? I have, but that's where furniture? the artistic stuff comes in. Um, my approach to things is to do things that are, have function. I'm not a, a good, enough of, good enough of an artist to do freeform uh, design that really is, uh, is more of an artistic piece, like a wood sculpture, for example. Mm-hmm. I've done a little bit of that for fun. But that's not where I have any real talent. To the extent I have talent, it's really just in, in taking 
uh, traditionally functional objects like chairs, tables, uh, bookcases, like the bookcase I have in the corner there, with all those the limbs as a those are limbs from oak tree, you know that that are irregularly shaped. They're not just straight up, you know, uh, right angle three by three or four by four supports. They're actually just I hand strip those from limbs of a tree. Oh, okay. And so if you look at them, they're all curvy, derby, and they look sort of cool. You know, as a free, for a f- support for a freestanding bookcase, but putting that stuff together and joining it—that's uh, a challenge to get it, the shelf, shelves to be low. Okay. Uh, but like I said, well, Carol's a much better artist. You look at the stuff she's done; um, she does collage. She she takes a lot of found objects, puts them together, and she's got a couple pieces you're looking at here, and then she weaves stuff together. Yeah, uh, she can do drawing and painting, but she's much more of a Collage and found object. And, you yeah. know, I think she's quite brilliant at it. My own. And she, and you can see like the mirror over your right hand shoulder. That's a lot of, uh, just bits and pieces of stuff that came from my shop. Bits of birch and, yeah, that birch and different, different scraps of, uh, oak. And, uh, she's even got part of an old belt of mine yeah. in there. I remember that was one of the artworks I photographed for her when we, in case she didn't tell you or maybe you've forgotten that we, Carol and I met when, um, I was a student of Sue Berg's uh-huh. in a, like a photography class. Right. She became like a client of mine where I would photograph her artworks. Well, I need to have photographs of my stuff. So maybe I'll talk to you after the <laughs> podcast about that. I do. I have to get a p- pretty much a, uh, the equivalent of a catalog of stuff I have. Yeah. You know, and I don't have, I have pictures from my iPhone, yeah. but I need better, better yeah. shots than and that. I had photographed a lot, quite a few things that are in this studio here, like the mirror or, um, this, uh, this the thing. woven piece, the, the small one. Yeah, there? yeah. And like a, a ch- there, there was a chair somewhere, or um, the birch one this around song, the corner. I think it was, and this like little, this tiny chest of drawers here. Uh huh. That's uh, sitting oh, on that one. pedestal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that one that she did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, you know, and, and also I with the furniture, I just really appreciate the the kind of uh, New England hardwoods. You know, I oak, different kinds of oak, pin oak, red oak. Um, I got some walnut, black walnut, which is really pretty, maple, ash, um, some cherry. You know, it's it's beautiful stuff to work with. Yeah. And what's really fun, like if you look at that table right to your left there, you know, we've got we've got some the the legs and the and the struts are again those are just from uh, limbs of trees, and when I caught just literally stripped the bark off them. And say, okay, this is sort of shaped the way I think I need something, or it's about the right diameter, you know. Mm-hmm. Then you strip it down, and you see what it looks like, and then you sand it up. You go, oh, that's really nice, you know. That's what I really get into. Yeah. Um, you know, and I just have an affinity for uh, for hardwood. Anybody who works with furniture, people, all, they sort of feel the same way. You just sort of almost get lost in the. The grains and the and the the, yeah. the texture of the wood as you're working on it, yeah. you know, so that you really enjoy it. It's very tactile. Yeah, this idea behind like constructing things that are very functional, like furniture, does mm-hmm. that come from like a very like is that a trait you find you as an extension of yourself? Like, do you find yourself very being very functional and practical with other things you do? Oh, sure. This, in fact, this pushes me out to be more creative. Because look, uh, I'm an attorney. I, I've been an attorney for for uh, almost 40 years now, dealing with construction, mostly construction contracts, disputes, writing a lot, reading a lot, going to court, going to arbitration, dealing with objective or quasi-objective information. Yeah. Uh, you can get creative to a point, a little bit, yeah, a little bit, but but mostly not. Um, so this, this, uh, uh, really is a, uh, lets me push out in different directions. I mean, look, if I was making something and it wasn't going to be all that functional, but it was going to, I was really into it and it was going to, you know, fine, great. Yeah. Um, but I've just found from my own, uh, trial and error that that's not where my real strength is. I'm interested in that idea of functionality behind what are you what you do or make because like carol may have told you like i'm kind of i have my hands in like a bunch of what you could say 
of fields that fit under the umbrella of the arts, like music or filmmaking or like podcasting. What do you do with music? Um, I'm a musician. What do you play? Uh, uh, guitar. My forte is guitar. Okay. I also try to play like piano. Okay. And what uh, kind of guitar music do you do? I first started playing any kind of amateur kind of person who's interested in like pop music. Like uh, I was inspired by the Beatles. Yes. And uh, but now I'm moved into more studying stuff like classical or jazz. Uh huh. Wes Montgomery, Kenny Burrell. Yeah. Yeah, like or Martin Taylor or. Uh-huh. Um, kind of steely danny like uh-huh. larry carlton kind of stuff right or right. i guess you could say my goal as a musician or as a guitarist in particular is to be able to arrange and play things for solo guitar yeah that's my that's my obsession what's really? the guy i'm blanking on his name great jazz musician guitarist like really fusion type guy he's total forefront top of the ch- not top of the charts but but currently, currently renowned, uh, John Schofield. Mm, keep going. I'm uh, just blanking on his name. I've seen him play. He's, he's tremendous. Uh, we have a CD of his around the corner. It'll come to me. Yeah. But anyway. Hey, but um. So you could say like I'm kind of a, a, an artist or something like that. Yeah. Well. But you know. like I have a background where I come from. When I was young, I wanted to very much into sciences, math, math and science, smart mm. sciences and stuff. And I like had a, a dream of becoming a natural physicist. And at some point, you know, that fell away. And I discovered arts was the thing I liked. Well, music's very mathematical. Yeah. yeah. But I was still very much like science minded. Everything had to be very definite, very um, measurable, had to have a function and a purpose. And you could say, in some ways, art is not that. And so. This trajectory is like me trying to grow into more of like an artistic perspective. Sure. Yeah, I think what we were talking about is I would consider myself more of a craftsman. Okay. You know, pushing pushing out as far as I can, but I wouldn't consider myself an artist in the furniture I do, the woodworking I do. Yeah. Uh, Carol's definitely an artist. I mean, all she, everything she could do is functional, some functional things if she wanted to, but it's it's all, yeah. you know, 3D, uh, some 2D, but mostly 3D stuff. This idea of a functional approach to, like, I find myself not caring for jewelry. Like, I'm so, quote, unquote, functional, I don't care about jewelry, uh, as opposed to other people. Mm-hmm. Do, you know, do you know what I mean? I love watches. Okay. I have about 60 watches, and most of them are in the... 10, 20, 30, 40 dollar variety. Okay. I have a couple that are a little bit. The one I have on today is probably in the 40, 50 dollar variety. But I have just different styles, different kinds. I just really like them. Yeah. So maybe it's, that's very consistent with, with what we've been talking about. It's some of them are plain, some of them are a little wacky. Yeah. This one is, this one is a gray one with a gray face. It's sort of, you know, a little different, but not too much. That's sort of what I, I was talking about, I, I, I guess. You have something that's functional, but it pleases you. It does more than just tell you what time it is, yeah. in other words. And, well, well, in my case, it's more... Or you got a hunk of black plastic on, on your... Yeah, this, on, is a, this is a Casio... And, yeah, and it's probably whatever. got like 28 functions for, you know... Well, uh, um, I mean, sure, it, I like, it has like the, base, the basic digital uh-huh, watch functions. Right. So like, it tells me the time. Uh, what tells, do you use it for? Do you use it for a calendar, alarm? More, just as a watch. And like the the rare moment that like I need a stopwatch or something. Okay, like there that. you go. Yeah. And actually, just in the past couple of days, I decided to use this for alarm for alarm. Okay, but of course you can use your phone for that. Yes, but like I find uh, at least in like the, in the past couple of weeks since I've like uh, gone off of school, uh, the like the semester has ended. Like I, I'll sleep in a lot, and like to the point where I'll sleep through my alarms that are still on from right. the semester. And like, even though I have a pretty obnoxious sound set for my alarm, it's like to I make find sure my, it wakes you up. I, yeah, I find myself I sleep through it, or like I just when I do quote unquote wake up, I like it's a reflex. I I roll over, hit the button so quickly that it's like I didn't even wake up. If you know what I mean? Yes. And so I figured, well, if I set an alarm on my watch, it's very it's on my arm. There's enough of a concentrated coordination of getting my hand, my my right hand, 
reaching over to my left wrist and pressing a button in a very uh, fine motor movement that that uh, that would mean I'm awake enough that um, after having shut off the alarm on my watch that I'm 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 quote unquote up. You know what I mean? Okay. And well, and uh, I think the the aesthetic that I have is very functional. If you like what I'm wearing right now, that's this, this is what I wear every day. Just a white t-shirt, jeans. Don't you want to g- jump out of that a little bit and get to something a little more colorful? Not really. Not really. Yeah. Because okay. like I don't. It's functional. Or if I if I ever do, it's like solid color shirts or, <laughs> and yeah. it's you know it's just very simple and it's tastefully simple. If you know well, what you're I mean. gonna get into a phase. Let's see. How old are you, Benson? I'm 23. All right. You're gonna get into a phase at some point in your life. We're going to go just the opposite. <laughs> and you're going to be wearing these flowered shirts and all these <laughs> colorful things. And, and because you're just going, ah, I'm going to just go in a different way. No, I don't. Well, <laughs> just wait. You wait when it, when it happens. When it happens, you go, God, Kaplan was right. I can't believe it. I appreciate your optimistic perspective <laughs> on my, my, my fashion sense, <laughs> but I. Oh, well, it doesn't have to be you. Somebody will dress you. <laughs> Girlfriend, no, friend, whatever. <laughs> no, but, um, it's like, um, I don't ever want to be flashy, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, I'm never going to be keeping up with the latest trends on clothing or, right. or whatever. Well, I'm but just it, like, I'm going to wear the things. So it'll I be have, what suits you. Yeah. I'm going to wear the things so I have things to wear. Yeah. And they're going to look fine. They're going to be fine. They're not going to be, like, for the most part, I don't care about what well, I wear. Well, you might get into, you're a monochromatic kind of, you might get into a gray phase, <laughs> a black phase, no. a blue phase. Yeah, uh, maybe. You, know? like, you don't know. Like, several... Periods of Picasso. I'm just gonna. It's right. Only wear cubes. Yeah. And, well, no, that, that, but uh, that might not be comfortable. Yeah. No, but like I only ever want it to be. I don't. For the most part, I don't care what I wear. But it has to not look terrible. If you know what I mean. Sure. Sure. Well, with clothing, though, you know, you can't get away from the function of clothing, unless you're uh, a model, and that's a whole different yeah. story. But. Um, I guess there's two kinds of wood, going back to woodworking, I guess there's sort of two types of, for people who do this individually, uh, in terms of making stuff on their own, as opposed to, you know, commercial furniture factories. You're either doing something that's very functional, yeah. or that's really more, more sculptural, and there may be a little bit of a whimsical, uh, function to it like you see benches or or really sculptural objects sculptural tables that could serve as a table could serve as a bench mm-hmm. could serve as a chair but they're primary they're primarily uh works of art right like we were saying i'm more in the functional but i, I love taking stuff like like behind you there's there's a chair over there that i just sort of stripped out the it's a conventional oak kitchen chair, mm-hmm. and I stripped all the struts, m- many of the struts out, and put in limbs. Or the uh, another thing in the corner there—that's a chair that actually is from one frame, the seat frame of a chair, and the back frame of another chair, and then all sorts of limbs and the ones with the ducks on the top, which are the from canes, tops of canes that I cut off and put on top of the uh, the edge of the chair, right. the rails. That's fun to do. You know, rip something up and totally screw around with it. Right. That's really fun to do. So anyway, so that's that. That's <laughs> talked about lawyer, talked about woodworking. I'm a writer. I don't know if you knew that. I, uh, I, I had heard through Carol that A, you have a bachelor's in English. Yeah. I actually have a master's in English. Oh. But that, yeah, that's just. And that. there's this one story she told me about I found particularly interesting when you, were working with a woman who had CP. Right. And it's a very, like, my left foot kind of story. Exactly. You were, yeah. like, tra- transcribing a memoir for her. Yeah, actually, I w- worked with a, w- a woman named Ruth Sinkowitz Mercer, who passed away some time ago, uh, way back when, even be, back in the, in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, and um, helped her write her uh, autobiography. And it was quite a, a, it was published by Houghton Mifflin. It's, we still have it out in paperback. Uh, it's called I Raise My Eyes to Say Yes. 
which is how she communicated because she was in a wheelchair. She's quadriplegic. She couldn't talk. She couldn't, couldn't really move very much. Yeah. Very bright woman. She communicated with facial expressions to where somebody would use word boards to assist her. But she was a very, very bright, dynamic person caught uh, sort of trapped in this virtually useless body. That was a, a big project and we've kept it in print. We still have, it's on Amazon. Some schools use it hmm. for uh, colleges. Some colleges used it, uh, have used it for years in educational courses for uh, teachers working either special ed or, or communication disorders. And uh, there's about four or five schools in the, across the country that still use it almost regularly. How did, how did you come to meet Ruth? Yeah. Uh, before I went to law school, I was finishing up a master's degree at UMass in Amherst. And I was sort of a year in between. Mm-hmm. And um, I just got a job working with uh, a very small educational group that she was part of. So there was an agency that provided uh, uh, sort of life skills and general educational uh, support for her and for other Severely handicapped adults who had gotten out of the, recently gotten out of the Belchertown State School. Okay. And it was a cool program. Very, t- very individually oriented. Very, very way ahead of its time. In, uh, 1978, I think is when I started with her. 70, 70, 78. Then kept up with her. And it took a, oh, I mean, I wasn't seeing her every day, but oh, it, we finished her book over a 10 year period. Oh. Probably was in real time, if we had met every day, it would have been about a two years of work. Okay. Oh, but it was stretched out over about a 10 year period. Then we got the book published, which was amazing. Got and a lot of, lot of attention to it. When, of, when was it published? It was published in, I'm going to say, uh, about 87, somewhere around there, 1986, 1987. Okay. And Maybe 88. What would you say you got out of the experience? Oh, geez, that's how long we got. <laughs> you, want, you want to spend a couple hours on that one? Uh, sure. It, in, in, in a real nutshell, uh, very few people have had this experience because there's not a lot of, there's all very, I don't know how many people, we count them on one hand, who were really like Ruth was. Someone who was so extraordinarily bright and expressive and communicative in nonverbal ways with facial expressions, uh, laughing, you know, sounds, sometimes crying, not too much, um, through her word boards, uh, through her personality, force of personality, to spend an hour with somebody like that who you know, so you know how she communicates. And you would, in the course of an hour, she might throw out a dozen words to you. And two or three of them would be to express a certain thought she wanted to tell you. Mm-hmm. Might be, I saw Benson. Mm-hmm. And say, oh, and, I, and if I knew who Benson was, and a lot of times I knew the people that she was referring to, her sister, her friend, someone who worked with her, someone mm-hmm. I knew. Uh, oh, when did you see Benson? And then you'd go a lot of guessing. Was it this week, last week, two weeks ago? Mm-hmm. Where did you see him? What was he doing? Uh, you hadn't seen him for a while. Had you seen him recently? And then she'd give you another word. Uh, she, I mean, today she might have podcast <laughs> on her board. Maybe she'd have uh, interview or something like that, or she'd spell out P O D, <laughs> you know, and then you go, Oh, uh, somehow you'd get to podcast. Yeah. And you say, Oh, he, he, he's doing podcasts now. Oh, really? You know, and you'd end up having this, this normal, but not normal, unusual conversation with somebody. Uh, and then you, after about an hour, hour and a half, she'd get really tired yeah. usually because her concentration level to express what we just talk about uh, is amazing. I mean, it's so hard. You think about it. If you had a word board with th- four word boards that had 800 entries on them mm-hmm. and that and that and your vocal expressions and facial expressions was the only way you could communicate, nothing else, which is really for her, that's what she had. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you wanted to express... Two minutes of normal conversation to somebody. It would take you an hour if you were really good at it. Yeah. And you'd be exhausted from feeding the clues to somebody. Yeah. And teasing them along. Uh, and that's what, so just in terms of the, your question was, what did I get out of it? 
so after you walk away from that, you say, wow, that was just amazing. And I must have had hundreds of conversations with her like that over the years. Yeah. But every time I would talk to her, it would always be this, wow, that's just, that's just different, you know, and it's very satisfying, even if you didn't have any great revelations in the conversation, just to go through that with somebody and connect that way. Um, because think about it. We're, we're in this very intense conversation right now. Yeah. It really is. You rarely, you do it outside your podcast. You rarely do this. I interview kids for Columbia College. I've done that many for many years. So I'll sit there and talk with a high school senior who's applied to Columbia and do, do an interview for a half hour, mm -hmm. 45 minutes, which is a very focused conversation. Yeah. What do you like to do? Oh, you know, what have you done lately? Oh, you know, what's your favorite subject? Oh, do you see a good movie? And then it gets you into different conversations. But you're really focused. Yeah. We really, we don't usually have those kinds of conversations with people. No, you think about it. Normally, your typical conversation is, even with a good friend, might be five or ten minutes. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. If that, right? Mm -hmm. To sit there and focus, like what we're doing is unusual. Yeah. Focus for an hour just talking, following up, trying to stay on topic or trying to stay interested or interesting. That's unusual. Now take it where one person's nonverbal. Yeah. And you're, that's how you're doing your interview. <laughs> you're interviewing someone who can't talk, but they're really smart and they got a lot of things to tell you. Yeah. That's way different. So it really changes your perspective on listening to people. Talk about having to become a good listener and become a perceptive uh, 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 individual and engaged in conversation. And maybe it really sharpens your observation skills. And it makes you much more self-aware, too, because you got to think about, oh, I'm upset because uh, this happened to me. Well, what if you couldn't talk and couldn't move? Yeah. <laughs> you know, how would, how would you feel then? So a lot of things you get from that. Yeah. And on some level, I think, this like the pod, me doing the podcast is was is like a conscious effort to try to listen more to people because when you are in this situation here, you are having a conversation that's going to last for like an hour, mm. an hour or more, and you know if you're not present, it's not going to go well. There are there are like certain episodes where I found myself not talking a lot just because I was. For one, like the guest might have been like really on a roll with their uh, telling the story, explaining this. And I'm just I'm very much listening because I'm engrossed in what they're saying. As as enjoyable as that is, speaking with someone like that who's nonverbal, it's that sounds like a whole different animal in terms of sure, you you like you like the person and you're doing this. You're, you're say, transcribing their thoughts to because you're you're curious about what they what they what they think, but I don't want to say this pejoratively, but that kind of it is draining for both you and her. Sure, uh, it, and it was different phases because a lot of times I would meet with her over the years, and it was interviewing. Yeah, it was to get information because I was writing, helping her write her life story, so she would tell me anecdotes what had happened, and I would get information from her friends who were with her, or other people who knew her, but it was really her story. So I'd fill in some information from others, but the story was hers, her viewpoint was hers, the events were what happened in her life. Mm -hmm. uh, I spoke to her parents, other people in her family, but again, it was from her perspective. And getting her take on things, her emotional slant, her, her uh, feeling about certain events... That was really uh, uh, the challenge. I think we succeeded. Everyone who's read the book has felt that way. So I think we we're very successful at that, both for her communicating it to me and for me to pick it up and capture it and writing it, you know, writing it mm -hmm. accurately. Right. Which I would then review with her. So it was yeah. a very interactive process all along the way. Right. Um, now, I haven't had a chance to read the book. Yeah. But are there any, like, Real standout kind of stories she would have she would have told that um, you think are 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 good to share. Well, uh, her whole the whole arc of her life was reflective of the treatment of uh, severely disabled people in the United States from 1950 to around the year 2000. 
she died in uh, she was born in 1950. She died, ooh, the late 90s. Oh, okay. Uh, or maybe, it was, yeah, I think it was the late 90s. I think, I think I'm think, pretty sure. I, I just have lost track of the date in my head. Um, but her life was in a couple of phases. She grew up in a very nurturing household. Parents were very supportive of her, understanding of her. She had a couple of sisters and a brother younger than her. Got to a point when she was, then she went to a very good private institution for a couple of years when she was about eight, eight to 10 years old. They took very good care of her. It was very, but then for different reasons, she, she couldn't stay there economically, mostly. Her father couldn't afford to keep her there. Mm-hmm. She was home and then her mother's health was very bad. She had taken care of younger children. So they had, the family had to make this awful decision in 1962 to send her to the Belchtown State School, which everybody knew was a horror show. Terrible, terrible place. Terrible place. And they didn't know if she would ever survive, really, but they felt they had no choice. And that in and of itself is a whole question you wrestle with. You could criticize her parents, say, why did you take her there? Well, they didn't want to, but they felt they had no choice. And did they have a choice or not? You know, that's a whole thing unto itself. Very difficult question. And it's, this is not bad people who said we don't care about our daughter. These were people of modest means with a mother whose health was bad, other kids. I don't think we can cope. Very, very tough. And the state, there was not institutional support from private or public uh, agencies or facilities in 1962. She was there until 1978 for 16 years, and it almost killed her. Terrible physically, she suffered terribly. Um, finally, they, people there, as the institution opened up, there were lawsuits about it, opening up the institution, improving it, getting people out of there. There was a whole story of the 70s in Massachusetts and elsewhere with those types of institutions. And finally, she got better treatment there, more progressive people, people dealing with her and helping her to communicate, developing communication skills, better living conditions, and then she got out of there. So that became a whole new phase, living with a small group of disabled people in, in uh, public apartments, sort of in a mainstream living, but severely disabled. That was also cutting edge in 1977, 76, 77, when that happened. So there's a whole new phase. And then once we got the book done and published, and it got into a publisher's hands because of her, which is a whole other story, which is amazing. But she was the one who ended up hooking up with, with a guy named Dick Todd, who was a big guy in uh, publishing, really renowned editor at Houghton Mifflin, had edited uh, big editor at Atlantic Magazine, great guy, great man. And um, he met her, and she delivered a manuscript to him and blew him away with it. And he called me and said, what is this? Tell me about this manuscript. Uh, I met Ruth a few weeks ago. She gave this to me. You know, what is this? Did, you know, did you, how, do you work with her on it? And all of a sudden, then he put it under contract, and we finished it in about a year after that. Then it got published, and it got all sorts of notoriety, national attention. We were on the Joan Rivers show. We mm-hmm. were on other TV shows regionally. Stories and articles in major newspapers, People Magazine, the New York Times Book Review, Boston Globe. I had a friend call me one day after it was on the front page of the Sunday Globe, which is a big deal. There was an NBC News Magazine that Maria Shriver did. They did a 20-minute segment about her. So it really was this, wow, this is crazy. Then she became a national spokeswoman for people, you know, disabled, treating severely disabled people. You know, and she would go for years from about, oh, this would have been the early 90s. She would go around for about a 10 year period all over the country being like a keynote speaker. She'd go with a friend or an aide who would deliver her remarks for her. Mm-hmm. I was with her a couple of times in front of like two, three thousand people at this big convention in Miami, you know, of doctors and healthcare providers. And she was a keynote address. It was really, and this was a woman who was, if she's given a keynote address in Miami at this big convention of doctors in 1992, roughly, 15 years earlier, but 20 years earlier, she's lying in a bed in, in, in an institution with 
mentally retarded people, severely disabled people, given up for dead. So that's the loop of her life, the arc of her life is mm. just amazing. Amazing. She, Ruth was really uh, one of a kind, that's for sure. Yeah. And um, Carol told me about how there was interest in adapting I Raise My Eyes to Say Yes into a film. There has been on and off. We've been talking about having it, uh, adapting it to a play. I've adapted, I've written a screenplay and I've also written a stage play based on it myself. Uh, I've done that. Right now, lately, we've been trying to get a, uh, someone interested to put it on, uh, stage to play, uh, in some form. That's still a possibility. I'd love to see something like that happen, but it's not like we have, oh yeah, we're hooked up six months from now, we're going to be off Broadway. I mean, I'd like to be able to say that because that's really what I'd like to see happen, but we're not there yet. So who knows if it'll ever happen. It's uh, difficult. If you look at the films that are the, have been made that are anywhere close, you really think of My Left Foot and The Miracle Worker. I don't mm-hmm. know if you know The Miracle Worker uh, was a successful play and about yeah. Helen Keller's story as yeah. a kid because when Helen Keller as a kid Blind and deaf. Yeah. So she wasn't talking and she wasn't seeing. And it, it, if you, I've watched that movie recently. It's the one with Patty Duke playing Helen Keller, which, which she got an Academy Award for or something. Or it was a very well renowned, well received movie. It's dated. Yeah. You know, it, it, you see it and it's like, oh, that's an old fashioned movie, even though it's probably made uh, 45, 50 years ago. But those are the closest. But, but still, Helen Keller's story is told through uh, Annie Sullivan, the Anne Bancroft yeah. character, her teacher. It's told through her. My Left Foot, of course, I think is uh, closer in some ways, but that character that Daniel Day-Lewis played, even though he was uh, he had CP and he and uh, uh, I met some of Ruth's friends were very similar to that guy physically. He could still talk. Yeah. What was his name? Christy something. I think his name was Christy yeah. something. He could still talk, and he was physically active. Yeah. Like one of the cool scenes in there was when he's the goalie, the soccer goalie in their alley games, and he just throw his body in front of people, <laughs> yeah. you know, because he didn't care. Yeah, but he was physically active, and he was verbal. He, even though it was hard to understand him, it was still verbal. Yeah, that's a very different challenge from having a central character who can't speak and doesn't move. And that's, but you, if you want to tell her story, there's a lot of, you're challenged in how you're going to tell her story. Yeah. And that's what we've sort of had, people have had difficulty uh, embracing when we've talked to people about, gee, adapting this for a play or for a film. That's a hard nut to crack. Yeah. There's a, this other movie, the, Di- the Butterfly and the Diving Bell, is that what it's called? The Diving Bell and the Butterfly? Yeah. And I, yeah, that was very well received a few years ago. That's about a guy who was physically very successful man who got in a car accident and then couldn't, as an adult, lost his ability to, to talk. He was paralyzed. Mm-hmm. That's a whole different, that's somewhat comparable, but that's different too, you know? Yeah. And I'm, I'm interested in, um, the, your process as a writer having to translate the story you know as Ruth's into different formats and say like a stage play or a screenplay. Mm, mm, and real. if like, um, so you have at least a degree in English. Well, also you, I have a, I have a George doctor and I write yeah, every day, but yeah. it's a very different kind of writing than I do yeah, and in my law practice. Do you ever, have you ever found yourself like a creative writer, like someone who writes fiction or like poetry or something? Sure. When I was, uh, yes, I've done, uh, Younger, I, did, I wrote a lot of poetry when I was in college. Uh, I like nonfiction, though. I've written, um, uh, I've written a, a different play, uh, which is based on family characters. Okay. But it's, it's sort of like almost historical fiction as a play because right. it's based on real events. And um, I've also written uh, about three quarters of a historical novel. But again, it's based on... Right. Uh, actual events. So I guess I have a total pattern here. It's easy to look at. Yeah. I do functional stuff and push it. Like, yeah. so historical fiction, the historical, it's not, it's not 
creative history. It's historical fiction. Right. So historical fiction has got to be rooted to me to be authentic and, and really of qual- high quality mm-hmm. has to be rooted in history. Yeah. I love to read historical fiction, good historical fiction, like The Agony and the Ecstasy uh, about Michelangelo. Awesome book. It's based in absolute history of him painting the Sistine Chapel. But of course, it's fiction in the sense of his thoughts, expressing his thoughts, filling in the blanks of things he did when nobody would know whether what he did, whether he did that or didn't do that. Yeah. Um, but that stuff to me is, is the, I enjoy that tremendously. And that's sort of the, what I gravitate to in a way. The furniture I make is historical fiction. Yeah. You know, really it's, it's in, it starts with, we were talking about that. It starts with a, you know, a, a, a given form, either an actual form like an existing chair that I rip apart and do crazy things with. Yeah. Or, or a form of a table that I do different things with. And that to me, it's very similar to historical fiction, but pure fiction, that's just not, how I think. Okay. It's just not who I am. When people, like, say, make movies out of, uh, based on true events, like, or someone's memoir or something like that, you know, there's certain liberties they take to, like, make it feel like a movie, if you know what I mean. Right. Because, like, you might abridge a part or um, change sure. a detail so that it makes more sense as a, as a, as a story. Yeah. Did you ever find yourself having to think like that when you were, say, adapting the book into, say, a screenplay? Well, uh, most recently, I've spent a lot of time in the last two years adapting as a stage play. Okay. So I can let me talk about that, where you have to deal with what might work, what would work on a stage. Yeah. And taking some creative license for dramatic purposes, but being authentic to the story. Right. And that's a balancing act. And uh, depending on your what you're dealing with, it's easier or not easier. Let me give you a slightly different example that I, the film The Irishman. Okay. Scorsese, De Niro, Pacino, great film, just yeah. came out, Netflix. I've seen it a couple times because I'm really interested in it. And I like it. I think it's a, it's a, it's a tremendous film. I don't think it's, I'm not sure it's the masterpiece that some people say, but I think it's a great film. Yeah. On very many levels. But it's based on a book called I Heard Your Paint Houses. Ir- I heard, you know, I heard your paint houses and they sort of slash the Irishman. Yeah. So the, I got the book a couple of weeks ago and I just finished reading it the other day. And I was fascinated by what Scorsese and the writer, I forget his name, the writer, uh, of, um, of the, Todd something or, uh, anyway, yeah. Steve, Steve something, whatever. That Scorsese and the writer, no offense to the, to the writer, but, um, what they kept and what they didn't keep, they kept a lot of that book. Yeah. They took a lot of dialogue straight off the page because the dialogue was really, really worked. It was authentic and it was right on. You know, from that expression, I heard you paint houses, which were the first words Jimmy Hoffa said to this guy, uh, Frank uh, Sheeran, who's yeah. the main character, when he first talked to him on the phone, I heard you paint houses, of course, which is code word for I hear you, you're a hitman. Yeah. Um, but that's right from the book. There's stuff right out of the book where you could take two pages from the book and say, okay, that's this scene almost without very little else in it. They just took these two pages and say, okay, we're going to film that. Yeah. And a lot of stuff they truncated, they abridged. You could see where they merged certain scenes. And a lot of stuff, obviously, they 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 didn't include because they couldn't. Yeah, it's a three-hour movie; it would have been a six-hour movie. And I bet, from a filmmaking point of view, they were way way grounded in that book, and and off and and um, sort I'm looking for, not authentic, um, true to the true to the book, consistent with the book. Um, it was faithful to the very book. faithful to the book, extremely faithful to the book. I bet there's never been a Hollywood movie ever made that was as faithful to the book as that film. Mm-hmm. There was nothing invented in that film at all. Like they didn't introduce phony characters. They might have merged a couple of people into one because they sort of had to for economy of storytelling. Yeah. But they did not take any substantive liberties or qualitative liberties with that story one iota. 
some people might say they should have to make it a little bit more zingy, but I think yeah. they felt that we don't have to. This is an unbelievable story. Yeah. We just have to figure out the, mo- the, the best way to tell it, not, not to depart from the book, but what's the, what's the most effective way to retell the book on film? That to me, I've never, that's, that's the most consistent, uh, film I've ever seen. That's, yeah. that's, that's true to the, to, to, to a story it was based yeah. on. It's like they found the, the source material. The, the stories that that book was based on were so compelled, were already so compelling that they're like, well, you don't have to actually like write, write it, write it. For the most part, you can just, for the most part, they were just like transcribing what they saw in the book into their screenplay. Sure. How do you stage this, this, this scene? We don't want to change the scene. The scene is incredible. Just how do we stage it in a film? How yeah. do we, how do we, and how do, obviously, how do we sequence, sequence the, uh, the evolution of the story yeah. because there's the story the film and the film and the story itself the book itself are both told in flashback form yeah you know it's it's charles brant who's the author of that book interviewing sheeran over in 15 years actually he started off and there was a huge hiatus where sheeran was in jail he got out of jail and then they picked the project up again when sheeran was looking at death and decided he wanted to come clean and tell about all the people he murdered basically mm-hmm. and but that interview process went 15 years in time it was basically a couple of months at the beginning and then about two years of intensive interviewing yeah um and then i guess once the book came out I'm trying to think of when it came out I know Scorsese was working on that project for 10 years, so it, ca- it had to come out in 2002, something like that. Yeah. When it came out and Scorsese got on top of it right away, it took him 10 years to get that film made. And this is a guy who's one of the most absolutely well, most respected, influential people in filmmaking in the world. And it took him 10 years to get a film made of this very, very... uh well publicized, uh, respected, sort of bombshell book yeah. about the guy who killed Jimmy Hoffa. So, whew, it tells you something about filmmaking yeah. at that level and the process that's involved. It's really something. Yeah, and Martin Scorsese had said going to Netflix was very much not his first choice, and that he was trying. To sh- he was shopping it around to get it produced, but like everyone was just saying no. And then his last resort was go to Netflix. But it, like you would think the words. Martin Scorsese wants to make a gangster film. Everyone would be on top of that in a bidding war. You know what I mean? Well, Rob, Robert De Niro was with him from, from day one on that. He co-produced it. So you had both of them. You had like heavyweight and heavyweight yeah. behind it. And you knew that they would be able to get anyone else they wanted to, which they did. I mean, they talked Joe Pesci out of retirement. Yeah, <laughs> retirement. He, he, no, he, he did not want to make yeah. that film. He, they had to pound him for like a year or two to get him to make yeah. that film. He, had, he said, like, he asked Joe Pesci like 50 times. Yeah. And it was perfect because Pesci, I thought, I thought Pesci was, stole the film in his, this very understated way. He yeah. was so good playing, uh, uh, Russell. Yeah. You normally would associate him with like the explosive kind of hothead from Goodfellas. Yeah, exactly. But then he's like this very. There is incredibly understated. Which of course made it that much more effective. Yeah. You know, I, there's this, I think that, uh, I enjoy, it was funny. I, I don't usually see movies twice, but when I saw it the second time, I saw it in the theater the first time, Carol and I saw it and we said, Oh, it's pretty good. It was, you know, it wasn't, it, it was three hours, but it didn't seem like three hours, but some of it dragged and yeah, it was good, but not tremendous. When I saw it the second time, I said, No, no, that was really, really great. Yeah. I liked it much more. Then that's what caused me to go read the book. And having read the book, I probably am going to watch it again, and I'll probably even like it more. Yeah. But that goes back to your story of adapting something. It's always a chore. It's tough. If we ever get this play, play or a film made, I, I may not be the one who, who finishes the, the screenplay or the script because I'm too close to it. Somebody else might, might need a, a little bit of a different perspective on well, it. Well, Stephen, I don't know if you heard, but I'm both a writer and a filmmaker. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll give you a go at it. We, we can hook it up. We can, we hook it up for some producer. And, okay. That's fine. I'll get you a copy of, of the book though. And, uh, uh, you can, since we've talked a lot, of, a lot about it, I'll get you a copy of it so you can read it. Not the Irishman. Not the book about Ruth. <laughs> you can buy your own copy of the Irishman. Yeah. So what else are you doing now besides podcasts? How are you uh, spending your time? Well, I'm in school. I'm a student. Oh, still? I thought you were done. 
No, I mean like the semester was over. I had, I'm not done yet. Oh, what do you what do you got left? One semester? Uh, a couple of years. Oh, really? Okay. What degree are you gonna What are you gonna get a degree in? Do you know yet? I'm well. I'm majoring in film and English. Okay. And this is at uh, Western. Uh, Hartford. Oh, University of Hartford. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. So where did you have a class with Sue? Uh, at the community college. Oh, okay. Where you like I, you, Art? Uh, yeah, I do. Although I don't have much to compare it to. So. Yeah, I don't know what their film program's like, but. Uh. I mean, it's all right. So, you know, I'm so film in English because, well, for one, I, th- I think film is like the. If you listen to the Carol's episode later on, you I will. I've got to go and find you'll it. You'll hear me explain to her like the way I found film was because I found it to be the ultimate culmination of all arts, really. Sure. And so I figured, oh, I'll major in film. But I knew like a degree in film isn't doing me many favors. Well, so, the, yeah, the only thing it does for you is it it could get you an entree at some point yeah. into some type of a j- entry level job in the film industry yeah. somewhere. And so I thought. Well, the only other thing I could tolerate studying is English. So I'm like, oh, I'll double major in English. Well, I like that. So. I was an English major and a history major in college. Okay. I don't regret either one of those. Um, they're in, they, they feed into each other. And um, I'm a big liberal arts person. So I believe that uh, no matter what you do, you should be very as well-rounded or multifaceted as possible. Yeah. Because so, it always helps. Um, if you're an accountant, knowing Shakespeare is going to help you one way or another. Uh, and it does, you know, uh, appreciating music, art, no matter what you do, it's going to be helpful. Yeah. And, um, I guess I have my hand in so many things like, um, like I'm interested in filmmaking or like music, uh, writing, uh, podcasting or like stand up comedy. And, uh, most people would see me, would, would look at me and be like, why? Most people have trouble like focusing on just one thing. I feel like it's me trying to, I don't like just keep doing things. You know what I mean? Like just always have plates spinning because I feel like I'm, I don't want to lose momentum. Well, you never know where. A door will open. The old expression, and Carol likes this expression, uh, uh, one door closes and another one opens. Yeah. You know, and that's totally true. And it, and it's happened. I, I can think of half a dozen times in my life where, oh, I'm bummed out because a door closed, something that I wanted to do yeah. didn't happen. <clears throat> but because of that, I was in a position to do something else that happened that turned out to be great. So you go, oh, I'm glad I didn't get that job, for example, because then a month later I got this job, right. which is way better than the job I wanted but I didn't get. Or you can apply that to many things. And, and it's just the way things turn out. So if you just keep on pursuing things that you want to pursue, frequently good things happen. I don't know if yeah. more often than not. It's hard to say. It depends on whose life you're talking about. But I think by and large, because what's the option? Oh, uh, Martin Scorsese hasn't called me this week, so I'm going to stop being interested in film. <laughs> no, I don't know. That's really not it. <laughs> or I've said, I mean, how many stories do you hear about people who, even like what you said about Scorsese, a guy like that, shopping this incredible project for years to diff- whoever he did, different studios or whoever, and then finally getting it hooked up. You hear about that all the time with people who, who send scripts around or, or, or manuscripts of books or screenplays or mm-hmm. whatever forever and forever and forever. And then finally it got made and won an Academy Award. Well, you don't hear about the, the thousand that never did get made and still never, never have. Yeah. But, but, but unless you're out there pushing it, it ain't going to happen. Yeah. You know, whatever it is you're doing or you want to be doing. All right. Um, well, I think we've gone on for a while and I see Carol's like, uh, walking around outside the studio. Oh, she is. Is she? Hoping to like, (laughs) maybe we're done and she can come in. All right. I didn't see her. I thought you were looking at (laughs) something. No, but, um, I, I want to thank you, uh, for being on the show. And 
again, congratulate you for being like the first guest who I've literally never met before. How did we do? Do you today. think? I think it, I think it went well. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, we filled up time. That's good, right? Yeah. Kept talking. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Good luck with everything you're doing. Thanks. Mm-hmm.